caring, and I've, then I've dug out metal, metal three, not caring again, and I've exposed uh, D0, D1, D2, all the bits of the data bus. There's that big piece of uh, metal. Now notice there's, uh, here there's a wire going down. It goes, like, it goes right here. And then here there's a wire going down. With the xenon difluoride gas, I can cut a hole. There's no metal right here normally. So I can go between two mesh lines, make, physically cut these metal three uh, tracks, this guy and this guy, make them a little thinner. As you can see, they're, they're still connected. They're just thin. And then go right through the glass down to metal two. It's, it's very quick. I could have done it if there was metal, if there was metal here, cut, like there, a metal covering. Uh, but metal three happened to be oxide here, so it was perfect. And this is what I call my reference. So whenever I'm going go to, I, I go to this spot, first thing I do is I make sure that I'm between tubes 26 and 27, and then I use the fib and I mill very slowly here at 30 picoamps. You mill too fast and you'll short out uh, too much beam current and you'd short this metal to the metal down below. So you need to, the fib is a fine-tuned instrument. It really is like a helicopter. You're flying a helicopter and you're the gunner as well. So you've got to do two different things at the same time um, and there's no autopilot. So, and you know, anyway, once this is found, uh, it's game's over pretty much. There were some other optical obstacles though that I didn't talk about. And those obstacles were, um, the core voltage was at 1.8 volts. So I had a big problem because I couldn't pick it up. I, I can only pick up, you know, how am I gonna overdrive a signal at 1.8 volts when I'm running 3.3 volt levels? So I overcame that by dropping my driver down to about 2.07 volts, 2.5 volt, 2.05 volts. And then my driver would, would pick it up. And then when I, if I overdrove a one on the bus, it overdrove it at 2.05 volts. Um, the chip was okay with it. Uh, they're very momentary glitches. And then overdriving a zero is just grounding, driving it down to ground, which is fine. But Pico Probe from GGB, their needle, their Model 12C, attenuates the signal by 10. So my old man, who's here in the back somewhere, <laughs> he helped me make a, uh, a multiplier to basically boost that 180 millivolt signal back up to about 2.3 volts, and then we feed it right through an, an, a normal TTL type of, uh, of, a, of a driver, and I get a nice square edge out of it. And so um, it goes from dirty to very clean. So two probe needles took this whole chip out. Whenever I'm gonna start digging that bottom reference, I move over 340 microns, now I'm ready to do production here. I'm going after a chip. I move over 340 microns, and in the middle of the screen, I, drill, I, I dig a box out, like just like this box here. Um, so then I, I, I'm looking for this line here, because this line here, I know from experience that this is tube 28. So then I put a little marking on it right there with the fib, and then I run 572 or I run 1400, whatever the microns up was, it depends on the chip. And then I, and then I write that, when I get up to that spot, then I draw a little circle and just the, to mark the substrate where I am. After that circle's been drawn, then I, draw, and then I make a, a box uh, using, using their CAD software. I draw a little box as if I wanted to mill. But instead of milling, I just use the box to align where, which tube am I on. And I drive the fib with the joystick to make it go back to the bottom. Because I need to make sure that in the middle of the chip, over the core, we're still perfectly straight and lined up with, what, with, with, with the right line. If I'm off by one line, I'll th just destroy the chip. The reference won't dig out right, and I'll be in the wrong spot. It's, it's, this is all stuff that takes time. Another trick, um, if the wire is floating in the air, it's not conductive, it's not grounded to anything. Grounding, I don't mean ground, I mean physically like connected to a, a circuit of some kind, it won't light up. It actually begins to absorb electrons, which means it goes black. That means it's charging. So I can take a mesh, if it's a complicated mesh, one of these zigzagging meshes that spiral and all this, like from Atmel, and I can just cut one line and then I can see everywhere that it went, as you see here. So here you can see that the white line is, is, one of, is, the, is showing me that this mesh tube went to this mesh tube, and then at the top of the chip, out of sight, it went to this mesh tube, then to that mesh tube. I mean, this is a beautiful trick that you can do in a focused ion beam workstation. Jeff, am I almost out? Uh-oh, uh-oh, okay. Um, here's another, uh, here's the instruction latch and uh, one other, uh, it's another a clock line um, from, the, from the fib. You can see I cheated. I opened with xenon difluoride to see down below on the floor, and then uh, I, I drilled a hole between these two wires and then filled it with platinum. Platinum is very easy to do uh, low power, uh, low beam current deposition, where tungsten needs higher beam current, okay? The final bridging looks like this when I'm done. So we went to the bottom of the chip, we found our reference, 
Once our reference is identified, I then, you know, I, my center of, of my point center is tube 28. So then I went backwards to tubes uh, 16, 16, uh, uh, 16, 15, and 14, and went all the way to the right to tube 61, and as far as 61. Any, any line within this, this bridging map, I can open. The, um, okay, this is what the chip looks like on a cross section. Here's, here's uh, metal one. Here's where we're going to go in the chip to metal two. Here's metal three, one of those planes of metal, uh, but the problem was it wasn't connected, so it's black. And then here's the mesh tube, but you can't really tell because I'm at a tilt. Here's the reference, a little bit zoomed in more. This is the first thing I go for whenever I, I do it. There's the circle I was talking about. So here was the circle for 228. I happen to be perfectly straight on this one. So when I went to the bottom, I realized I was lined up with the reference that I drew at the bottom of the chip. So then there's that fat piece of wire. It's twice the thickness of a normal wire. And then the, the other tracks are 400 nanometers wide. So you, there's bit seven, bit six, and so forth. Once this reference is dug, it allows me to line up my access to go across to, to dig the wire out. Um, dig in a hole. So this is what a hole looks like. Here's th I told you four tracks. Um, four tracks takes a lot of time, so I got it down to three tracks now. I can even probe it into two tracks, which is half the size of four tracks. Um, but four, two tracks is really, really hard. It'll take me the whole morning to probe the chip, where three tracks, it's, it takes me an hour to finish. Um, so you can see the three tubes, they're alive on the, on the, uh, on the top side because they're pretty white. And on the bottom side, they might still be live too. I don't know which hole this had been in the chip. If it's the first hole, though, that would explain this, why they're white on both tips. So now you can see this is metal, this is metal three right here, and it's a solid plane of ground. So I've dug these mesh tubes out. There's a little bit of the remnants here, and they're not shorted because I use xenon difluoride gas. The final result of all this, of all this drilling is this chip's been physically bypassed. Here's data bus bit two. Here's the reference. Here's zero. You can see there's zero, there's one. Remember, there's two live tracks here. Here's six, there's three, four, and then five. And you can see the curve in the wire here. If we go back and look at those optical pictures, you can see that curve in the wire as well. This doesn't look very beautiful. It doesn't matter. The, it, the, the, it's doing exactly what I needed it to do. It's opened enough that I can get a needle down in this small hole. This is about three microns in change, and it's a, half, it's a 0.4 micron width uh, wire. Um, so I can get the needle in the hole without shorting it to the ground right here or shorting it to the, to, to the mesh tubes. And the chip has no clue that I'm even inside. Um, let's see, okay. So once we're inside, the, uh, the stuff that I didn't really get to show you guys starts. And you know, you sit on the data bus and this is what you see. In the clear, 8051 opcodes, sitting bus for clock cycle for clock cycle. Boom, very first instruction, any Infineon executes is a long jump. Why? I don't know. We'd have to ask them. So boom, you got a long jump. It's seven clock cycles. And it, this is the time it took to execute. If you didn't know how long an instruction is, you can go for the instruction latch. You can do a lot of tricks with the latch, but the biggest advantage it has on a 66 uh, is to uh, show me when the instruction fired and how many clocks it took. So you can see it's opened, and now it's closed to hold a value. And it's closed until it opens again right here, Clo and then here again. So you can follow this to, to know the length of an instruction if you don't know. Maybe you don't realize it's 8051, but you can at least tell how many clocks something took to execute. And if this had been a normal type of chip, I could freeze, the, freeze that latch, and I could make it keep the instruction on the instruction registers while I sit on the data bus and listen. So the data, it thinks it's a NOP all the time, or an add, or something that's one or two byte fetch. Meanwhile, I'm on the data, on the opposite side of the, of the, of the instruction registers, e uh, eavesdropping, picking, picking up bit after bit of, of the linear code that it's running. This file is pretty confusing to look at, so I wrote some tools. And um, the tools basically take that file and make it ni nice and pretty like this. I call this a running disassembly. So this is the running code of everywhere the chip went. And this is the real, this is real Infineon code. Um, and you can see here I've got notes. Um, the very, on clock 29, they started to, to, to enable the dummy, the dummy bus cycles. And basically, if they OR into register 8B and 80, set bit 7, they turn on dummy bus cycles. So what are we going to do? We're going to whack it. So just like I talked about in Vegas. So we're gonna, when they do, an or into eight, they do an OR into 8B, with bit 2, I was able, with bit 7 is the easiest line, basically. If this is an Xbox 360, I do my glitches on 7. If it's the TPM part, I glitch on D2, because, just because I had 
other glitches later in time that D2 satisfied the requirement to, to kill the, each of, the, of those.